Your Worship, the Mayor, Lady Maris, my Lord, ladies and gentlemen. Most of us seek to establish during a working life one career and hope that we leave some little impact on the community we leave when we retire. To some of us is given the intellectual ability to carve out two outstanding careers. And we have such a speaker here with us tonight in Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. Having chosen the profession of medicine and trained at St. Bartholomew's Hospital, in 1927, having been a physician and an assistant to Lord Horder, he felt a call to the church. And he went from London to Aberfan, which has figured so largely in our lives in recent years, to become a minister at a Presbyterian church there. He stayed there until 1938, when he went back to London and shared the ministry of Westminster Chapel, Buckingham Gate. And he stayed there until his official retirement 30 years later. He's published many works, I think of particular interest to us as doctors, uh, two lectures which have been published, The Supernatural in Medicine and Will Hospitals Replace the Church? But tonight, following the theme which we have established in these Welsh orations of the relationship between medicine and the community, he has chosen as his subject the role of medicine in modern society. I give you Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, His Worship the Mayor, Lady Mayoress, my lord, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to say in a hurried word what a deep sense I have of privilege of being asked to deliver this oration this evening. Uh, I understand that this is the fifth oration and that uh, the previous four have been divided between medical men and laymen. And that raised the question in my mind as to what exactly I was as the fifth. And uh, you've been told something about that already. I was wondering how the chairman uh, would describe me. I was afraid he might refer to me as a hybrid, or perhaps even as a, a hermaphrodite. But he's been kind to me, and I'm very grateful for that. However, I, I'm very deeply sensible of this honor that you have done me in asking me to deliver this oration. My only title to uh, speak at all on such a subject is what you've already heard, and uh, in addition to that, my continuing interest in medicine. You may find it very difficult to credit this, but medicine uh, for the last 40 years or so, more than that even, has become my hobby. And I can assure you it's a very interesting hobby. It's good to be able to look from the outside, as it were, on something uh, concerning which you may have a modicum of knowledge. But especially I'm here because uh, I still am a great admirer of what I regard as the greatest of the professions. I'm not in a profession now, but uh, uh, this is to me the, still the greatest of the professions. And as one who is concerned about the future of the profession, and especially its relationship to society, uh, I availed myself of the opportunity of putting certain thoughts before you. The last thing I'm going to do is to give you uh, any advice. I believe you are having much more than your share of such advice at the present time. Now, I want to emphasize this idea of the role of medicine in modern society. I put my emphasis on the modern because I needn't uh, take any of your time in reminding you of the amazing, quite astonishing change uh, that has taken place, especially during the last uh, 40 years. That's one of the advantages of becoming old, that you can look back and compare and contrast the present scene with what once obtained. And I'm old enough to remember the old idea of the doctor, the medical man, the man who was the guide, philosopher, and friend uh, to the family. 
who knew the family history, knew every member of the family, and uh, knew all about the various uh, happenings and circumstances and so on. Uh, that was the position, I would say, roughly until about some 40 years ago, perhaps even less than that. And as regards medical ethics at that time, it was comparatively simple. Uh, there were certain rules. Uh, the doctor mustn't advertise. Uh, he mustn't uh, make advances to female patients. And he uh, mustn't criticize his colleagues, at any rate in public, criticize them and their treatment. Uh, the rules, ethical rules, were comparatively simple. And so I still have this picture of a, a doctor entering a house, a home. And it was quite an event. Uh, the tendency of the housewife, the mother of the family at that time, was almost to spring clean the house when a doctor was going to pay a visit. He, he, he was such an important man and was regarded with the highest respect possible. Well, that was the position, as I remember it, and as others of you perhaps uh, may remember it. Uh, but a great change has taken place, uh, quite an astounding one. Uh, one of your colleagues in South Wales was telling me comparatively recently how quite often now, uh, when he does enter a house for a visit, uh, he finds that uh, his visit is almost resented. The family are watching something on television. And he's an intrusion. And they don't want to turn off the television just uh, to listen to what the doctor's got to say. Well, now, uh, such a, a transformation I is quite amazing. It, it almost passes comprehension that such a change should take place. And uh, many regard the, the doctor almost as a servant, and he's subject to criticism. Uh, I noticed recently that even the TUC uh, ventured to express an opinion with regard to infamous conduct in a professional respect. And I wondered whether the day would come when the medical profession would be controlled by Messrs. Jones and Scanlon. Uh, however, uh, this is the position, and it's, it's such a change that I, I find it extremely difficult to accommodate myself to it. Uh, recently, a book has appeared bearing the title Need You a Doctor Be So Useless? Uh, by Andrew Mellison, a medical man himself. I noticed that he took the precaution of moving to Canada before he published his book. <laughs> uh, and then, quite recently, uh, I have read a book called Complaints Against Doctors by Rudolf Klein, published this year. And the very fact that such a book uh, has ever been published and come into being tells us so much of this whole change in the relationship between the doctor and the patient, or the doctor, and the public. But I gathered from that book that it's a matter which is considered to be of the most urgent importance. Well, now, there is the great change by which we are confronted, and on which I base uh, my remarks. Uh, I am going to approach this position uh, by, first of all, considering the causes of it. Uh, for 46 years, I've been trying to shed medical thinking, but I'm a complete failure. I, I still have to approach every problem, whether it's theological or anything else, in this medical manner. And I start with the causes. And what are the causes of this truly astounding change that has taken place in this relationship? And I would put first, I think you'd agree, the National Health Service that uh, which came into being in 1948 was truly a climactic point and things have not been the same ever since. I need say no more about that. You know more about it than I do. But I, I, it's not the only cause of the change. And uh, I, I really want to stress and to emphasize the other causes. So I put second, uh, the very advances that have taken place in medicine. I, I believe they have been in a large measure responsible for this changed relationship. For instance, I remember the sulfonamides coming in in the 30s, and then the uh, antibiotics coming in afterwards, the extraordinary development in anesthesia. And then, of course, this uh, amazing development in the psychopharmacology, or whatever you may 
like to call it, psychotropic drugs uh, and so on. The, the stimulants, pep pills, so on, and then the tranquilizers, uh, and then the various uh, developments uh, with the uh, hypnotic soporifics and uh, so on, the antidepressants. This, this, this surely is, is, is an amazing development. I would have thought equal in importance uh, to uh, the coming of the antibiotics. Then, in addition to that, we uh, have had the uh, physical treatment of uh, mental and psychological troubles, this uh, physical method of treatment. That, again, uh, I hope to be able to show, uh, has introduced a very important factor in this matter of the relationship. And then the surgery of the brain, leucotomy, and so on. And finally, of course, and more recently, this whole question of transplants and the possible development of this transplanting of new organs into the body. Well, now, I, I'm suggesting that these advances in medicine itself have played a very big part in the change in the doctor-patient relationship. Then uh, another one I, I would put in would be that uh, doctors, as I view you now from my position on the outside, uh, have tended to become more and more technical. Uh, I seem to see a lessening of the old professional uh, position and uh, in an increase in the technical element. The doctor becomes less of a professional and more of a technician. Again, of course, a direct result of these phenomenal advances to which I've just been referring. And then another factor in this changed relationship is the increased public interest in medical matters and in the behavior of medical men and uh, a changed attitude on the part of the public. The press, for instance, uh, has been venturing to criticize and to give its opinion. You get articles by laymen and what medical men do is being questioned and examined. Then something else called TV medicine which, uh, were I given the powers of a dictator, I would prohibit completely. I regard it as extremely dangerous. I still remember uh, how was, uh, when, as a very raw student, uh, I was reading in a textbook about pleurisy, and I always remember how within half an hour I developed an acute attack of pleurisy. Entirely mental, of course, but uh, there it was. Well, that's the kind of thing that you're asking for with this TV medicine. A little learning is a dangerous thing and especially, I would have thought, in the realm of medicine. And then I mention another factor, which as I travel a great deal these days and talk to people and stay with both doctors and lay people, I have a, an impression that the thalidomide case has had a very profound effect upon this peculiar relationship between the doctor and uh, the patient and the public. It, it, it made people think and question and examine. Uh, we've all read the articles, we've heard the discussions. I must try not to digress on this matter, but it seems to me to have been grossly unfair. Uh, but this is what happens when the public, uh, with its lack of knowledge and of information, ventures to express opinions uh, on medical men and their works and their practice. And then, of course, we are face to face with this whole permissive society in which we live. And this has created new problems for the medical men, which uh, his forefathers certainly did not have to face. Uh, the permissiveness that has led to a, a great interest in birth control, uh, the use of contraceptives and uh, the desire for abortion. Now, this, these are new problems that have come in and, have, in my opinion, had a very profound effect upon the relationship between medicine and society. And my last uh, factor, the last factor which I would suggest to you at this point is this. The uh, conflicting evidence given by doctors in public law courts, this seems to have affected the public and uh, has shaken their confidence. They find two men of equal standing in the profession disagreeing profoundly and completely with one another in their evidence in a public law court. And this raises the question 
in the mind of certain members of the public as to whether either, either of them is really to be, believe, to be believed. And whether this old idea of this charismatic personality, the doctor, wasn't a lot of rubbish, and that the doctor, after all, is more or less a very ordinary person. Well, now, these, are, I think, are the factors that have all conspired together. And the result, as I see it, is that the doctor has less and more power at one and the same time than his predecessors used to have. Uh, I am afraid the mystique has gone. You know that mystique about this, uh, I think it's a good term, this charismatic person who came into the home and uh, everyone was silent and one looked upon him as a kind of oracle. The, the mystique seems to have gone. And uh, to that extent, uh, the doctor has less power because that was a very powerful thing. It gave the doctor great authority and people were prepared to listen and to accept his verdict and were very glad indeed to receive it. Now that's gone. So that seems to have lessened the power. But on the other hand, I think uh, the doctor has more independence than he used to have and that has increased his power. And as the technical aspect of medicine develops and increases, and the doctor becomes more and more of an expert, obviously his power will correspondingly increase because people will feel they don't know and therefore have to be more dependent upon him. So there is the position and the causes of the position as I see them. Now, the thing I really want to direct attention to is this. The dangers and the new problems that arise as the result of this changed position. And I'm going to try and put it under a number of headings. The first is uh, the dangers and the problems that arise in the doctor-patient relationship. This, I think it's got to be admitted, is less personal than it used to be. I'm quite sure of this, as a matter of fact. And there's an interesting paradox here. There has been more talk about what is called psychosomatic medicine than there was when I was doing a bit of medicine 50 years ago. A new interest, as it were, in the whole person, the whole man, and not merely the local organ or the particular disease. Psychosomatic medicine. One would have thought that that automatically would have led to a greater interest in the person as such. But it seems to have worked the other way around. And there is less personal interest in the patient than used to be the case. Now, why is this? This is what fascinates me and interests me, and I've been trying to analyze this. This uh, lack of a diminution in the relationship between the doctor and the patient. Uh, again, uh, assuming the NHS, I have a feeling that somehow or another the antibiotics have been almost as important as the NHS itself. In this way, uh, I still remember the days when, if, when a patient had pneumonia. Uh, you there saw him propped up in bed, breathing rapidly, great trouble and we watched him and the doctor visited twice a day to see what was happening and what he could do how he could medicate certain symptoms and so on waiting for this great crisis to develop well, the doctor was in and out he he had to be it wasn't that he could do very much unfortunately but uh, nevertheless he was a great source of comfort and uh, his visits had a great psychological effect uh, but it meant that there was this intense personal contact but now of course patient uh, gets a chill and a temperature and so on, and the doctor is told this on the phone, he says, send somebody around, I'll give you the tablets. And uh, the tablets are sent, the antibiotics, or whatever they may be, and in two days and so on, everything is quite all right. And the doctor may not have seen the patient at all. Well, now, this clearly has made a profound difference to the relationship between the doctor and the patient. I suppose the subconscious argument is this, if the tablets will do it, why need I bother to go there? The tablets are going to do the desired thing and there is no need for me uh, to waste my time or my energy in, in going to see the patient frequently. 
And then, of course, another factor is the development of the whole idea of uh, clinics and the tendency to get people to come to the clinic and, uh, instead of visiting them in the home. I, I think this has been another important one. And then group practices, of course. Uh, I, I'm not of necessity criticizing these things. I'm merely mentioning them as factors which seem to me to have led to this loss of the personal interest between the doctor and the patient. Uh, the group uh, practice means that you don't always see the same men as you used to. And uh, if you happen to be living in London and are taken ill at the weekend, well, it's very difficult to tell whom you may see if you see anybody at all. Uh, all this has had the effect of lessening this relationship. And then, uh, uh, comparatively recently, as I've been observing it, the um, appointment of secretaries and appointment secretaries. Uh, this, this is a new factor, and people complain to me quite often that they, they can't speak to the doctor. There's this, I'm sorry, so they say sometimes, terrible person that uh, answers the phone and says it's no need, no need for them to talk to the doctor. She can deal with the whole situation. And, and so the patient uh, doesn't get the contact with the doctor and is uh, not allowed to ask questions and uh, is often not even allowed to speak to the doctor directly. And uh, in the same way, a lack of information. The patient isn't uh, spoken to and told what the condition is and what's going to happen in the way that used to be the case. There are these persons coming between the doctor and the patient. Then uh, the, uh, another factor is uh, this uh, deputizing service. It's certainly very much the case in London. Uh, if you're ill at night, uh, it's almost certain that you won't see your own doctor. Uh, but some deputizing doctor, newly qualified generally, attached to a hospital, will come to see you. And uh, were there more time, I could tell you some amusing stories in that respect. However, that again, I think, has worked in the same direction. Next, I would mention the tendency to specialization even amongst general practitioners. Group practice, but one man's interested in children, another in geriatrics, and another perhaps in midwifery, and so on, and the tendency for them amongst themselves uh, to specialize. So all the cases with particular complaints go to one, and, and the others to another, and so on. And on top of all this, what I would call general over-specialization, I was very tempted when I first received this kind of invitation uh, to take as my subject medicine, art, or science, but I rejected it. Uh, however, I'm simply mentioning now that I I'm afraid science is winning the victory on all hands, and the more scientific medicine becomes, the less personal it will become, and this whole relationship between the doctor and the patient will deteriorate. The result is, with this ultra-scientific attitude, uh, that the patient becomes uh, nothing but uh, a case. Indeed, when I was ill and had uh, quite a big operation some five and a half years ago, I began to wonder whether I was a man or a test tube. Uh, all I heard was to talk about input, output, intake, output, and uh, what was the position of the potassium and the sodium, what was happening to the electrolytes, I, I began to wonder, was I there, or was I just some curious uh, test tube lying uh, in a bed? Now, th th this is one of the dangers that's inevitable as medicine becomes more and more ultra-scientific. And when you add to this what is known as clinical experimentation, which to me raises a very serious and important ethical and moral problem, which I can't touch tonight because I'm trying to be general, but I think it's a very serious one. It's all very well to say, you know, oh, well, we got the patient's consent. But how many patients are in a position to give consent to some of these clinical experiments? They don't know, and they're afraid to refuse any request that comes from a medical man. And the result is that I think here there is a very serious problem which will have to be faced. Well, now, there, I think, are some of these factors with regard to this personal relationship. What are we to say about that? Well, I'd just make a few comments. 
I think it's quite clear that the attacks upon us as human beings that come from the outside in the main have been mastered and can be cured. I mean infections and things like that. Uh, now these can be dealt with with these antibiotics and these other remedies. But increasingly, and this is to me what's so important, increasingly I imagine that in the future the real problem confronting medicine will be those diseases that arise from the inside. Not infections, not things that come to us from the atmosphere and elsewhere, but the things that arise within. The whole question of stress, the problem of stress, again this psychosomatic medicine, raised blood pressure, coronary trouble, cancer, and of course these psychological conditions which are so much on the increase and will be inevitably because of the pace of life and the very permissiveness that is so popular which creates so many problems. Now, I imagine that here is going to be the field in which the medical man will have to exercise his skills more and more in the future. And because of this, I would argue that the personal approach will be paramount with these particular diseases. Infection, all right, send the tablets, let an intelligent secretary even send them, or a nurse, I think you could train them fairly soon. But with these other conditions, surely, sympathy, understanding, reassurance and so on, are absolutely vital and essential. And I sometimes have visualized a position in which, as I say, the nurses or the secretaries could be doling out the various medicaments without any trouble at all. Were it not, of course, for uh, certain idiosyncrasies and various iatrogenic diseases and so on, and various other unfortunate side effects. However, the main point I'm trying to make is this, that the personal relationship will become increasingly important as these two big groups of diseases and conditions of ill become more clearly uh, delimited and the line of demarcation becomes clearer and clearer. However, I leave it at that. Let me hurry to a second group of problems and of dangers which it seems to me have arisen and will arise more and more. And here I would describe it as the power of the doctor as the result of the new knowledge, the drugs, the operations, and the various other things to which I have referred. And this, uh, surely, is quite an alarming problem. The doctor today has power to not only influence character and behavior, but to change it by means of these various drugs, or by means of certain operations. Uh, I was reading recently this new book by Professor Henry Miller of Newcastle, uh, his excellent book which bears the title Medicine and Society, which is excellent reading. He's a natural writer, and it's a most interesting uh, book. He quotes uh, Virchow, you remember, sometimes described as the father of modern medicine, the men who first wrote about cellular pathology. Virchow said, medicine is a social science, and politics, nothing but medicine on a large scale. Now, I think I understand what Virchow meant by that and what Henry Miller would, meet, would mean by that. But I think it's a, a dangerous statement to make. And I've read a book recently uh, called The Politics of Therapy by Seymour Halleck, uh, an American psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. uh, the Politics of Therapy, and he doesn't hesitate to go so far as to say this, that it is actually the duty of the therapist in these psychological conditions deliberately to influence the political opinions of the patient. He makes quite a thesis of this, and again, it's very interesting reading. 
But here, I say, surely is a problem. And medical men uh, will have to face this very seriously. I think uh, the position of medical men is going to be extremely important in this matter. Take, for instance, what we know to be happening in Russia, where men who dissent from the common philosophy and politics and point of view are not only thrown into prisons, but are now being treated by medical men so as to influence their conduct and their behavior. The same thing is happening in a measure in the United States of America. Uh, I believe there are some grounds for saying that there's quite a little of it even in this country. And you may have read recently of a conference held by Amnesty International to consider this whole problem because of the terrible danger to individual liberty which has come about as the result of the discovery of these amazing drugs that can in this way influence personality. Uh, it's especially dangerous, of course, in any dictatorship, uh, whether it be uh, the communist or the fascist, it doesn't matter which. Any dictatorship which doesn't recognize a man's right to dissent and to disagree, given these drugs, this great power, uh, finds itself, of course, in an extremely dangerous position from the standpoint of everybody except the rulers. And uh, we have to face certain possibilities such as this. If you grant that it's right to use these drugs on any sort of uh, agitator, any man who dissents from the commonly accepted view, if it's considered to be right, uh, and if medical men can persuade themselves that they're even doing a kindness to the, to the patient in uh, quietening him down a bit, well, you might very well arrive at a position when you'd never have another political reformer. Uh, either the status quo would continue or some dictatorship would continue, and it would be impossible ever uh, to change it in any way uh, whatsoever if these drugs had been used in the past. Uh, some of uh, our greatest fellow countrymen uh, would no doubt uh, never have been heard of. Uh, Lloyd George would have been silenced immediately when he was a young attorney and uh, fighting his cases and up against everybody. You'd have just given him a tranquilizer or something and that would have been the end of Lloyd George. Uh, but the point is that if this is done, any reform surely will become an utter impossibility. Or take another very interesting uh, problem, and especially for us here in Wales. What are you going to do with your poets? Because it is true, isn't it, that most of the best poetry has come from rather odd personalities. Uh, men with a grudge very often. A grudge against society. I remember uh, a colleague of yours and of mine at one time telling me quite seriously, and he really believed it, and he was a very able doctor, that he had a patient who happened to be a leading Welsh poet. And this man wrote a rather violent poem against, against the British Empire. And the doctor was quite certain that the cause of this, the immediate cause of the poem was that that man's daughter had failed her London matric the day before. Uh, this, this is, you see, the kind of genesis of poetry. Uh, disgruntlement, disease, uh, unhappiness. Uh, the stories of these poets, I think, illustrates this quite clearly. The, 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 they're rather odd men from this uh, psychological standpoint, and they get their release by pouring out this poetry. Well, now, if, you see, you gave them your tranquilizers or your antidepressants or anything else, They'd be easier people to live with, but uh, you wouldn't have much great poetry. So this, again, is, a, is, a, is quite a serious possibility. If the doctor takes it upon himself uh, to decide what kind of personality people should have, he puts himself into a position where he may put an end not only to great politics, but also to great poetry and to great literature. So I think we need to consider these problems very seriously. And then you've got this uh, whole idea, the possibility of genetic engineering, not only influencing those who have already been born and are living, but even 
influencing those who are going to be born and producing some kind of standard type. I know this is sort of science fiction. Uh, I don't think it'll ever happen. Uh, I was pleased to read uh, Sir John Eccles ridiculing the whole notion of this and uh, men of that authority is to be listened to. But nevertheless, these are possibilities that seem to arise as the result of this phenomenal advance. And then there is the whole question of eugenics and so on. The only lecture I ever heard in my life on eugenics was delivered in the library of St. Bartholomew's Hospital in London by the late Dean Ng. I don't know if any of you ever saw him or heard him. He was a strange-looking man, and he was very short-sighted and a high-pitched, squeaky voice, and went, couldn't help wondering and thinking to oneself, would he ever have come into existence if eugenics had been in vogue in his youth? However, these are the points, you see, that arise almost inevitably. But I want to come to a third danger, uh, a third problem. And this is the doctor as an authority or as an expert. To me, this is very serious again. This arises partly from the fact that certain medical men claim too much. They set themselves up as authorities and speak with a dogmatism which is not based on knowledge quite frequently. But it isn't only the fault of the doctors, such doctors, but this is imposed on medical men. Quite recently now, I've read two headings in newspapers which illustrate what I'm saying. This was one heading. Health foods cult is nonsense, says expert. That was a doctor, you see. Health, food, health foods cult, cult is nonsense, says expert. The other was Welsh are born to ill health, says doctor. Some of you may be familiar with that. A colleague down in Swansea, in the Swansea area, uh, said that Welshmen, uh, because of their genes and the nationality and so on, were more subject to certain diseases than others. He'd been collecting statistics for seven years, and he had come to this conclusion. It was a genetic problem, and he gave statistics how they died more frequently of heart trouble and of cancer of the stomach and of the gullet and so on. And his statistics seemed to prove this. But then a Welshman working in, oh, this was an Englishman, I should have said, who said this in Swansea. But a Welshman working in Scotland ventured to disagree. And he said, no, it was more due to the environment and more due to the hardness of the water. Well, now, I, I was really tempted to disagree with and to criticize both these experts. And I, I think I have certain information which I could pass on to them. Whether this is the right medium through which to present it to them, I don't know. Uh, Welshmen more subject to these diseases, high blood pressure, heart trouble, gastric ulcer, and so on. What's it due to? Well, uh, I take the question of superior intelligence for granted, uh, but uh, uh, I, think, uh, I think there is another obvious explanation. It's been my lot now for 35 years or so uh, to do a good deal of traveling not only in Wales, but in England and in Scotland. And I made a most interesting discovery, which I think answers the problem confronting the expert in Swansea. The d difference I've discovered is in the difference in the character of the hospitality. Now, the English people are as hospitable as the Welsh and the Scotch, but they don't show it in the same way, and particularly in the matter of cooking. The Welsh hostess, in my opinion, is dangerous to health because she's so anxious to please. She, she likes to give you a meal with what she calls a lot of relish. They throw in a final lump of butter or too much sugar. Uh, the English will give you a nice meal, but it'll be plain. Meat, potatoes, and some vegetable, and perhaps some tinned fruit, uh, and occasionally a little cream. It's, it's very nice, it's very good, and I think they're doing the best they do the same to one another. But that's not the Welsh idea of hospitality. They, they shower it upon you, and there is this richness in the diet, which to me seems to be the obvious explanation of these various diseases. 
Uh, next to the Welsh in this respect, I would put the Scots. And uh, I'm speaking purely out of experience. But the point I'm making is that any medical man who makes any kind of pronouncement in these fields is always referred to as says expert. And it's his ipsa dixit. Uh, something resented, of course, in the realm of theology. Uh, it's only popes who claim that kind of uh, power and authority. Uh, but uh, this is what is often accorded to medical men because of their superior knowledge. However, I want to say this. I, I don't believe the members of the medical profession are as guilty in this matter as some of our learned judges. Uh, whatever you may say about medical men, what should you say about the judges who take it upon themselves uh, to assassinate people's characters as they deliver their judgments in court and seem to speak as if they were authorities on every conceivable subject? Well, you can take comfort. You're certainly not as bad as they are. But the serious thing to me is the danger that arises from this view of certain medical men in particular as experts. I take, first of all, those who specialize in psychological matters. Uh, I was reading in that book to which I've referred by Halleck in America, The Politics uh, of, of Prescribing, he uh, says that uh, American psychiatrists were polled by one of these weekly papers in 1964 as to whether one of the candidates in the presidential election was emotionally fit to be president of the United States of America. And a large number of them replied and went on record. They'd never examined the particular individual. But by just reading his speeches and reading about him in the press, they took it upon themselves to give a pronouncement and a judgment as to whether the man was emotionally fit or not to be president of the United States. And then, of course, the whole question of giving evidence in courts. The great debate at the moment is this. We have this mounting moral problem, moral juvenile delinquency, breakdown of morals the increase in crime. But the question that's arising is, is this a disease or is it a crime? It's a most urgent question. And this new category of diminished responsibility. There are many who no longer believe in sin. There are many who don't even seem to believe in crime. Everything is a disease. And every delinquency can be explained in terms of diminished responsibility because of the patient's condition. I speak with knowledge, personal knowledge, when I say that the influence of Freudianism in the home office is quite remarkable and has been for a number of years. A lady once came to me. She was in trouble, psychological trouble. Why? Well, she was rather an important person in this department and she had been compelled, more or less, to undergo deep analysis for two years in order that she might have experience of it and thereby might be able to guide the people who were under her in that department. And the effect of this deep analysis had been to create problems in that poor woman's life which had not existed there before. And it took some time to get rid of them one by one. So there, you see, is another. And take the effect and the influence of Freudian ideas upon our educational system, our whole view of how children are to be educated, whether there is to be discipline and punishment, the influence of Freudianism, which has come, of course, from medical men in the main, has been quite astonishing. And then we have our friend, Dr. William Sargent, uh, taking it upon himself to dismiss the whole of religion, almost as an aside. I tried to answer his first book, The Battle for the Mind, and now reading his uh, second book, The Mind Possessed, I'm afraid I'll have to try to repeat the dose. Uh, however, uh, with his knowledge, he claims that he can dismiss religion, the Christian religion, he, and he affects, of course, the lives of many people. Now, these are all instances of the doctor as an expert because of his knowledge. He sets himself up as an expert, and others set himself up. What's the answer to this? Well, it seems to me the answer is this, that more and more people are coming to see that Freud was never a scientist at all. 
the man was a poet. But he was taken to be a scientist because he claimed to be a scientist. And his teaching was swallowed, whole, without any discrimination. And it's had this almost devastating effect in so many realms during the last 50 years or so. Uh, I wish I had the power to make everybody read Jung and Jung's criticisms of Freud and his reasons for departing from Freud and his school. However, there is a real danger here, it seems to me, that the doctor speaks dogmatically as an expert. And then I come lastly to some of these ethical and moral matters. The doctor is regarded as the authority in the matter of contraception, abortion, homosexuality, euthanasia, and sometimes just maintaining existence, not life, just keeping life going. A patient has really ceased to be, but there's a kind of test tube existence and the doctor keeps it going. Now these are some of the problems that are arising acutely in an ethical manner. Now here I, I feel again is a very important matter. The danger is, of course, as uh, I was reading in an article in the Harvard Theological Journal of a year ago, an article by uh, Professor Robert Veach called Medical Ethics Professional or Universal. His great point was this, what he called the generalization of expertise. The generalization of expertise. And he illustrated it in this way. He said, would you dream of calling upon the Defense Department nuclear bomb experts to decide whether to bomb or not an enemy country? You see, these men are experts on bombs. Would you, therefore, go to them for an opinion as to whether you should bomb another country, simply because they're experts on bombs? But he quotes a doctor, and I thought this was really good. A physician in America who said that an abortion is no more a medical question than capital punishment through electrocution is a problem in electrical engineering. Now, I think that's such a profound statement, I'm going to read it again to you. It is that a doctor, uh, an abortion is no more a medical question than capital punishment through electrocution is a problem in electrical engineering. In other words, your electrical engineer is an expert. He's got expertise in that department. Do you ask him, therefore, to decide whether a man should be electrocuted? Of course you don't. A doctor has expertise in birth and all the problems connected with the birth of a child. Does that entitle him to be the authority who gives the final opinion on the rightness or wrongness of abortion? I agree with this, Professor Veach, that this is a great fallacy and that it is the problem of technical knowledge versus value judgments. And these two things are very different. These problems which I've mentioned, uh, contraception, abortion, uh, euthanasia and all the rest of them, they're not really medical problems. What are they? Well, they're theological problems. I'm very sorry. I, I'm, I'm not uh, taking advantage of the opportunity of a bit of special pleading. No, no. These are theological problems, pure and simple. They're moral, ethical, ultimately theological. What decides them? What decides these is this. What's your view of man? What's your view of life? What's your view of death? What's your view of what may or may not happen after death? These are the factors and the considerations that really answer these questions. So the medical man, because of his expertise, must be very careful here. His danger is, of course, to impose his own ideas, moral, ethical, yes, let me say it, even Christian, upon his patient. And he has no right to do so. No man has a right to impose his own personal views on the patient. Now, because of this relationship between doctor and patient, the patient is ready to listen on the whole. And the danger is then that the doctor will tyrannize the patient. I've always said this to Christian medical men, that they mustn't foist their opinions upon their patients. 
they're being bad doctors if they do so. Certainly give an opinion if asked for it. But uh, at the same time, the doctor must have the right ultimately to refuse to do something that is definitely against his conscience, whatever it may chance to be. It's a difficult knife edge, this. All I'm trying to say is this, that uh, the doctor must be very careful that he doesn't take an unfair advantage of the position and that he doesn't make this tragic blunder of confusing his expertise with his value, his moral, his ethical judgment. Very well. I come to the close by asking what then is to be the role of medicine in modern society. And here, surely, the great thing is the importance of having a balanced view. The doctor mustn't be a dictator. Professor Veit says again, the professional paternalism which negates individual freedom in favor of professional decision-making is rejected by an ethic which is applicable to all humanity. The doctor mustn't be a dictator, but neither must he be a slave or a mere servant of the public. It seems to me that many people today are thinking of their doctors, their medical men, in much the same way as certain old Eastern potentates whom you read of. You remember they used to have their great banquets. And at a given point in the banquet, one slave used to have a, came along and he had a kind of a balloon at the end of a stick which he hit at the back of the ears of, of this great emperor or potentate in this way. He was actually stimulating James's nerve, you remember. And that was something that improved the man's digestion at that point. Well, now, it seems to me that many people are regarding their doctors now more or less as the slave who tickled James's nerve. What's a doctor? Well, he's a man who gives me a certificate. He's a man who gives me pills. And they more or less send, send a demand. And he's expected to deliver it immediately. And if not, a complaint will be registered. This, surely, is, is quite wrong. What's the matter? Well, I feel that what's gone wrong is this, that it is this whole matter of this relationship between the two. It is this lack of balance. And from the medical standpoint, I am a little afraid that it is due to an increasing failure to realize the true greatness of the profession. I was reading in the current number of modern medicine. The first article by the chairman of the Patients Association, she says in that article that one of her people had told her that uh, he'd sent for a doctor in the middle of the night. And the reply the doctor had given is this. The doctor said, I don't call out the plumber or my solicitor or my accountant in the middle of the night. So why should I turn out? Now, oh, I think that's really tragic. That's a case, surely, for the General Medical Council. That's infinitely worse than infamous conduct. I don't care how bad the morals of a doctor may be. I'd forgive him a great deal. But when a man has that view of the medical profession, puts it into the category of the plumber, and even, if you like, the solicitor and the accountant, he can't see the uniqueness of this profession. Here is a man coming to people in an hour of need and of crisis, when they're troubled, they're unhappy, and the whole family is involved in this. And yet, you see, this man clearly, it seems to me, fails to realize that, that he's in this extraordinary privileged position. And the doctor becomes increasingly important as the church goes down. People no longer go to places of worship. They don't consult their ministers. They go to the doctor. To whom can they go? So they go to the doctor. And this enhances his privileged position in society very greatly. What then, in my humble opinion, is the greatest need? And I don't hesitate to say this. The greatest need of all is for great general practitioners. This is the plea I would leave with you. I read some of the other day a statement to this effect. General practice, said the writer, will remain a dangerous mixture of 20th century science and, me and, and medieval witchcraft. With great risk, I venture to put in a plea for the medieval witchcraft. All right, go on with your modern science, your 20th century science. 
but don't forget what he calls the witchcraft, which I'd call the mystique, the charisma of the doctor. I put in a plea for a new order of, or a new conception of general practitioners, and in addition, general consultants also. The chairman was kind enough to mention the fact that I worked for some six years with Lord Horder. He was a general consultant. He wasn't a specialist in any one department. He was a general consultant. And that, I think, was the whole genius of the men and the great value of the men. Well, then, what, what is the general practitioner to do? What is the general consultant to do? Well, his main function is to keep an eye on the experts, on the specialists. Have you heard Marshall McLuhan's definition of a specialist? You know, the stimulating Canadian, Marshall McLuhan. Uh, this is his definition of a specialist. A specialist is one who never makes a small mistake while moving towards the grand fallacy. Think of that. That's his definition of a fallacy. Never make small mistakes. But what about the grand fallacy? Uh, so that's the first business of the general practitioner to keep his eye on the expert. He doesn't finish with his patient when he goes to the expert. Follow him on. Keep an eye on him. Uh, help the patient to decide. It's a terrible thing for a poor patient to have to decide whether to have an operation or not. The general practitioner is to be there by his side and to help him. And he's to keep an eye on the treatment of the whole man when the specialist tends to look at only one part of the man. What are the guiding principles, then? Well, the first great need, I think, is humility. The greatest danger of all, as the result of this phenomenal advance in medicine, is for medical men to claim too much, to speak beyond their knowledge, to speak beyond their right to speak. I notice increasingly the humility of these great Nobel Prize winners, what do we really know about the brain? We talk about manipulating it, changing it, affecting it. What do we know about mind? What do we really know about both these? And the answer is very little. And yet people play with these drugs with impunity, not realizing that they are going well beyond the knowledge which they possess. So we must keep humble. Remember the great Hippocratic principle, do no harm, do the patient no harm. But I want to go beyond that and put it in a positive form. Do unto others what you would have others do unto you. If you're confronted by the question of one of these clinical experiments, look at it in that way. Would you like to have this catheter pushed down your veins and into your heart and so on? Would you like it to be done to you? It's a very good test, this. Do unto others as you would have others do unto you. Above all, concern for people as people. Concern for the whole man. Never was there greater need for character in medical men. Understanding, sympathy, patience. Yes, and self-sacrifice. I would like to see a new order, I say, of general practitioners coming into being. Men who have a sense of vocation, men who are aware of a call, men who are prepared to be counselors in a general sense. They can send off these patients to the specialists and the experts as the need arises, but they still maintain their hold on them. And the patient can still go back to them. They're always in charge. Surely this ought to appeal to many young men today. The doctor in the community, I believe he's in many ways going to be the guardian of personal liberty. He alone, I think, can do it because everybody will turn to him because of his expertise. I think personal liberty may well be in the hands of general practitioners of this type in the years that lie ahead. And it would be a wonderful thing if a body of men, an order of men emerged holding this high, exalted view of the general practitioner in society and in his community, serving the public. I would pay him, well, more than he's ever asked for. 
in order to encourage him to give himself in this way to helping his fellow men and women. What's my prognosis then with regard to the future? I believe that after the upheaval through which we've gone in the last 30 years or so, that medicine will settle down again. We'll see that we've reached a, a point of no further advance. And then we'll be able to sift all this and to take a more balanced view of it. And medicine, I think, will settle down again into a happier condition than it's been in during the last 30 years. All this, of course, if the uh, experts and the technicians, as the result of their brilliant advances in knowledge, but their corresponding failure to advance in wisdom, haven't succeeded in destroying themselves and us and the whole of civilization in the immediate future. Well, such are my ruminations and thoughts about medicine in modern society. Some of you, no doubt, have been amused at the obvious conflict that's been going on between the lecturer and the preacher. Others have diagnosed a kind of mental diplopia. Uh, others have, di have diagnosed an obvious case of schizophrenia. Well, uh, whatever, whatever your diagnosis, all I say is this, that as one who has this profound respect for this uh, great profession, I hope I've been able to convey to you this one idea, that there is still a paramount need of those ideas and motives and thoughts which moved and impelled a man called Rehe to found St. Bartholomew's Hospital in 1123. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, I don't know what the diagnosis is, but you are certainly, sir, not geriatric. <laughs> you have been privileged to listen to one of the great Welsh orators of our time, and I can only add to this your thanks to him for giving us, as doctors and as patients, a great deal to think about for a very long time. Thank you very much. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.